Hi, everyone, and welcome to today's LinkedIn Live. Uh, I am uh, really excited to learn more um, about this, uh, our, our today's guests and his company. Uh, today, we have Michael Weening, who is the president, CEO, and board member um, for a company called Calix, uh, which I was not familiar with, but uh, now that I know a little more, I'm eager to share that with you. Uh, good morning, Karen. Good morning. Thanks for joining today. Uh, let me just bring you a little more to the front. If I can figure out how to do that for my reduced settings, and uh, we'll get to hear more about uh, your organization. There we go. Um, so, um, Michael, you're coming up uh, on your one-year anniversary as CEO here at this yep. company. I think you've been there for six or seven years now. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the company itself, uh, and then maybe we can pivot into sort of what, what you've learned, what kind of lessons you've learned over the past year. Sure. Um, Calix is a cloud and software platform company. And as our mission statement says, we, we work with broadband providers. So the people who actually are serving us today um, mm -hmm. in this session. And what we do is we help them transform their business. We help them uh, do really three things. The first is we focus on simplification. So making it very easy for them to you know, reduce cost, operation, operate efficient, uh, mm -hmm. efficiently, and then also get to market quickly. The second thing we do is we help them transform their go-to-market strategy and excite their subscribers. And for them, subscribers could be you, Karen, as a consumer, but then also you as a business. Mm -hmm. So how do we make really exciting experiences and make everything that you do on top of their infrastructure better and better and more interesting? Mm -hmm. And then those two components come together in the third um, thing, which is growth. And what's interesting about our company is we really have two constituents from a customer point of view. One is a traditional for-profit company, and those could be family-owned or private equity or public. Um, but then 42% of our customers are actually not for profits. There's this great um, component inside the broadband industry, which is cooperatives, which means they're member owned and they're very focused. So for growth, they think very differently. They actually think about you as a member and how do I make your life better? And then they really focus on their community. And in that community, they're focused on um, how do they bring people into their towns? How do they grow the economy? How do they help businesses thrive? And then last, how do they help children in education, you know, really transform um, what's going on from a multi-generational point of view. In fact, one of our customers said, you know, we're making this massive investment in broadband for our town because we know we're the 13th poorest region in the United States and mm -hmm. over multiple generations, we know we're going to have an impact on these children as they grow up and completely change the face of the region. So. That's really what we do. And, and at the basis of that is the democratizing power of cloud and software. Um, yeah. So why don't we just keep pulling on this thread for a minute? So I'm thinking about like libraries in the early 19th century where mm -hmm. people didn't have access to libraries. And so there was a great movement uh, and a great deal of philanthropy in order to uh, make sure that libraries were available to people. And I, I'm thinking about this in sort of the same way. Is that a good analogy? It's a very, actually, I've never heard someone say that, but it no. absolutely <laughs> is 100% true, and I may steal it. Yeah, um, welcome to it. <laughs> but it is, uh, it is absolutely a great analogy, because if you think about what was important in, around the war, so if you go back to World War II, mm -hmm. you know, it was really about water and electricity. Those became the lifeblood of how you grow a community. And you saw that expand out through the United States. Electricity started in the big cities and then expanded into the, the rural areas, right? Um, the same thing is now broadband as, is as important, I would actually argue, in some homes more important than water and electricity. And so that same lifeblood of the community is, is what our customers are doing to change them. So exactly. Okay. Um, so uh, what's the sort of the current state of this, what I think it's been dubbed the digital divide, um, and why does it continue to be a problem? I think it's something we, we all acknowledge that um, the broadband um, access um, is key to uh, to a modern life today? Well, it's it's about infrastructure and making those mm -hmm. investments. So I say I would say that the infrastructure investments that we see coming down actually worldwide, where people have recognized that broadband is, is important as getting you know power to the home, mm -hmm. is, has now been crossed. So the governments and um, are seeing this as an opportunity to make the investment to actually make that happen. And you look at what's going on in the United States around the Infrastructure Act and across the world, you're seeing massive investments. And, and a lot of those are public, 
private partnerships because you also see a lot of private equity organizations realizing that broadband is an incredibly good investment. So they're investing in our customers, bringing that into the local community. And they think of it as something that, you know, if I put a dollar into it, I can monetize that dollar over a 40 and 50 year life cycle. So Mm -hmm. I would say it's been problematic. It's not fixed, but I'm very encouraged that over the next five to 10 years, we're going to make a huge leap forward with access to this technology and eliminating that divide. Terrific. Um, and K- Calix's role, so I keep wanting to say Calix, Calix's role in this. Think, ca- think California. That's how oh, I was taught. There you go. Thank you. Perfect. It's like the difference in Beaufort and Beaufort, Carolina. Exactly. So I've, I've got a, a, a way to remember that. All right. So Calix's uh, uh, role in this, you've um, made a transformation as an organization from uh, from broadband hardware to being a software based company. Uh, Can you talk um, a bit about what that transformation was like for the organization? Sure. I joined the company seven years ago from Salesforce. My background is Salesforce, Microsoft. I lived in Europe. I lived in Tokyo. Um, So I've done business globally. And when I joined the company, it was halfway through this transformation of Mm -hmm. moving from a hardware company to a software and cloud company. Mm -hmm. And if you actually have read The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, Dilemma by Christensen, Yes. You could literally make us a chapter of that. You have that on your book's shelf for you. Yeah. It travels with me. Yeah. It, it's, well, it's a seminal book for technology. And within that book, it's around how do you take a company and transform it either as a startup, which is easier, frankly, versus we had to say, uh, when we were going through this transformation over the last 12 years, we were a public company. And so I joined kind of halfway through. We are founder led, and our founder, this is his third multi billion dollar company. And I saw it as a great opportunity to learn from him. Um, and part of what he drove was the innovator's dilemma mindset, which is don't invest in the legacy and build a new company while we're actually executing. It was incredibly difficult. And I would say probably one in a hundred can actually accomplish it. If it wasn't for our founder, we never would have been able to do it because had I been the CEO at the time, we joke, I would have been fired 15 times over <laughs> and, uh, for losing my, you know, making the massive investment while everybody else said, well, why just do what you used to do? Right. But we, we, you know, threaded the needle, actually got through that. And we've transformed this company into a software and cloud company. And our, our strategy is very similar to Salesforce um, where, you know, I worked and I've observed significantly over a decade. And it was, first of all, build technology and platforms for small companies and scale them up. That was the first thing that we did. So the same technology and platform that we built will run the next generation um, network for Verizon. But then it also runs in a company called Cedar, uh, in Cedar Falls, Iowa, who only has 2,000 customers. Mm-hmm. And so that scalability from 2,000 to 100 million is really core to our philosophy. And then the second thing is make sure that it's easy to consume and readily available and really invest um, from a team point of view to help your customers through the transformation of their business. So I would say from Christensen, those are the key, the key tenants that we implemented in the company success. Yeah. Well, congratulations. It is a very difficult um, uh, transformation to make. Um, I was I interviewed someone a couple of weeks ago whose company had been purchased by Panasonic for like seven billion dollars or something, um, and then uh, and then they had this period of time when they were sort of private <laughs> in a way uh, to go through everything you had to go through to make those that transformation. Um, sounds like you had a uh, a more public way of doing that, but um... but that's a that's a really good point. Actually, there was a period of time when you know our our market cap was down to about two hundred fifty million dollars, and we actually had the conversation as a leadership team: should we take it private? Yeah, because it would have been way easier to do it um, privately. Uh, but in the end, we were able to to soldier through. We had great customers who stuck with us, which we're really fortunate about because they could have said, hey. Why aren't you making the stuff that we're already buying and using more effective? Why are you doing this thing, which is a big risk, and we're not sure we're bought into? But they stuck with us, and and now they're reaping the benefits, which we deeply appreciate. Okay, sounds like that the dip was a buying opportunity, had had we only known. So, oh, it absolutely uh, was. There you are. Yeah. Um, so uh, you've been quoted as saying, "Speed alone is not a winning strategy um, in terms of um, broadband." Um, what are some examples of how your platform services um, have made a difference, especially in rural communities? So one of the things is that we really we identified, which is what we've been pursuing, is that that you as a consumer can go buy things off the internet, but there's about 60 or 70% of people who actually would love to get some help, right? 
I don't know about you, Karen, but you know, I find when I, when I have technology, I'd rather have somebody helping me with it. That's why I'm a big Apple customer because I love when I pick up the phone, they'll help me and I'm willing to pay for experience, right? I don't want to have to sit on a forum and have some 14 year old try and help me meander my way through it while my family's irritated because something's not working. And so we really worked with our customers to take technology that is provided technically from a retail point of view and provide management around it so they can support it. And a good example of that would be um, Bark. So you can buy, Bark is basically a social media uh, monitoring platform for parents. And if you, you know, with a child, what you can do is look at all of their, the things that are going on on their cell phone. And it sends a lot of alerts to the parent around cyber bullying um, and suicide threats and dependence on alcohol, all these different things. They actually, they go as far as stopping first party shooter incidents, things like that. And so they, they work with psychologists, all these different components, and there's about 6 million children are supporting it. But as a parent to do that is really difficult. So service providers are now offering that service via our platform. And they're, what they've done is you can buy it direct or what you can do is buy it from your service provider. And the value you get is that they're showing up at your PTA meeting. They're partnering with your local school. They're available. And if you have a problem, so for example, if you, you know, misconfigure your child's Facebook and block them out or do something. Your image is free. Oh, you're back now. Okay. Sure. Uh, Sorry, I'm in a hotel with not great broadband and the blandest background possible. Okay. So, okay. so we create that experience where the service provider can actually add value and help you through it as you set it up or if you're having problems. That's the value add we provide. Great. I think you're also on pace to organically surpass about a billion in revenue this year. Uh, so it sounds like there's uh, there's great, great demand for that. Um, I'd like to talk now just a little bit about um, Calyx itself. Uh, I know you've, you've been there for a number of years. Um, and Calyx's culture uh, is something that um, I, I don't know how much of a hand you had in creating it versus what was there before, but uh, maybe you could talk about what makes the culture there unique. Well, I, I did have a hand in it, but I would say that the culture is ours. So I'd, I'd say the first thing is from a culture point of view, we have a very straightforward view with all of our team members, which is culture isn't something that exists to protect. Culture will constantly change and culture is owned by all the team members. So this whole concept of, you know, let's protect our culture, you know, a culture is a thing. It's not. It's actually how you and I treat each other each day. It's how we act with customers. It's how we treat with partners. And, you know, throughout our careers, I don't know about you, but you know, how many times have you worked for a great leader, been part of a great team, and everyone's like, oh my gosh, that team is such a great culture. And then the leader le uh, leaves, they're replaced by somebody who's terrible. And then everyone's like, oh, where did the culture go? And I, and in my view, that was, that's my view of culture is that it's not, it's a transient thing. And it really is the responsibility and accountability of all of us. So I'd say the first thing is we're very, very clear that everybody needs to participate. And I've honestly stood up in front at town halls and said, look, if this culture sucks, it's um, why are you blaming me? It's your fault. It's your fault just as much as mine. Let's fix it. And so you know, that's the first thing. And then the, the other components are um, we have a great purpose. We're very fortunate because our purpose is our customers and our customers as I talked about, are really about transforming their communities, education, helping children and parents and businesses. And so that's really rewarding. Um, and then the other part of it is that we're an all remote culture, which is a big hot topic right now. It's not yeah. for everyone. You're hundred percent remote and we've grown from 700 employees to almost 2000. Um, and, you know, proud to say we were voted best place to work in Silicon Valley, you know, and we all laugh about Calix who, right. Um, uh, and I believe that remote culture is a big part of it because we've made it since 2016 core to what we do. And yeah, and so it gives us a, a huge competitive benefit because we have employees saying, you know, do I really get to work wherever I want in the United States or Canada or internationally? And we say, absolutely. And so um, that remote piece is a big, and then the last part is, um, our number one philosophy is better, better, never best. So this constant mindset of everybody, if you want to be great, we have to constantly change and everybody needs to get it. And I always love that better, better, never best. Um, perfect. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Culture is the behaviors that an organization, right. my definition, the behaviors that an organization encourages, uh, allows, 
uh, and um, and tolerates. Uh, and if you don't pay attention to the things that you are tolerating, you know, I mean, that that's part of your culture too. It's not that it's not the stuff that's written on the wall. It's what we do every day in terms of how we interact. Uh, so I I couldn't agree more with you, Air. Well, Karen, I, I would just change one word is that I think it's it's organization and people because the other part too is an organization can't police, right? In the end, to your point is that, you know, what are the uh, the behaviors we tolerate? Well, that's going to be at a meeting, you know, so three people are in a meeting, one person's being rude. If those other two people don't stop and say, you know, you just give us a break, you're being a little bit too harsh or rude or whatever it is then how do you improve? And and I think that's that accountability shift is critical that everybody needs to take accountability for it every single day. Yeah, completely agree. Um, and you were a fully remote organization since 2016. Wow. Um, what precipitated that shift? And uh, how do you, yeah, how do you, how do you function uh, fully remote? Do you bring people together from time to time? Yeah. How does that work? Yeah, so... Uh, um, so in 2016, we had about 70%. Every was remote. The R&D organization actually was partly remote, partly not. There's still a lot of mm-hmm. people saying, hey, we're going into the San Jose office. We have like five development sites, right? And they were pushing back a bit on it. And like I'd say, well, it's kind of funny because when I go into the office, I see you guys all quite hiding out in a meeting room on Zoom talking to the other development sites. So you are virtual. I don't know why you need all this office space. And then obviously COVID just made that go away and we couldn't drag them back into the office with whips and chairs and big semi-trucks to drag them. It wouldn't happen, right? And so, but for us, it was, look, we're a small company compared to a Google or a Facebook or someone like that. So this attractiveness of purpose, which is go and analyze our customers and realize that the work you do actually does, has a greater good effect. So is that important to you? And it, And I've noticed, especially with, the next generation of people who are younger than me, I'm 55. I was just trying to, you know, make money and get myself out of poverty. But this next generation is very focused on what does it mean? What am I doing? And and so they find that purpose really powerful. And then this remote part came, it became a competitive benefit where we said, and we're going to give you the flexibility versus working inside a big company. Now, how do we make it work? Well, we've been all video since that was what I brought in 2016, converted everything to all video. Everybody got web cameras. And I would be the nag of all nags saying, turn your video on, turn your video on, turn your video on, right? Um, and then we do enable the teams to do two things. One is they're regularly bringing people together. So the real estate savings get reinvested into meetings because, you know, every, I don't know if you've been with big companies, but they always say internal travel is bad and they're on yeah. how to get. So I keep reminding and saying to the team, no, no, put in your budgets, make sure you have planned to do team meetings, give them that flexibility so they can get together. Uh, and then the second thing is our our talent and culture team has actually started to build a lot of local meetups where we provide quarterly budgets so that, you know, everybody in a town can get together. And we, we've done a geographic mapping in around 30 different locations and saying, hey, this quarter, this person is going to run it at this restaurant. Everybody come together in the afternoon. And get, you know, get to meet the people from other groups who are not in your organization, but local to you as examples. Yeah. So acknowledging and encouraging sort of these, um, I think about the building of social capital, which is what we do when we're face to face and then um, been using that when you're remote. Uh, you know, I had one other thing too. Is yeah, of course. I'm actively in asking people not to start meetings on time. And let me caveat that, which is. Take a moment at the beginning of the meeting and actually just say, hey, how you doing, Karen? Like, what's going on? Like you normally would if you were at a, on a coffee break. And so constantly saying, how do we actually interact socially at the beginning? Don't just make it about, you know, let's get through the next meeting. Because that's where you get that Zoom fatigue, right? That constant grind of, you know, do another meeting, do another meeting. So try to take, make it social and then really encouraging the managers to make sure that they're in tune to social cues, look, you look tired, you look distressed, and then call them up afterwards and say, let's have a conversation. What's going on? Is there anything I can do to help? Right. Perfect. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, you're coming on your one year anniversary as CEO. Uh, what are some lessons you've learned in the, in the past year, or maybe goals for the coming year? Sure. Um, I would say that they're not necessarily lessons. They're more an expansion of what I've known. And and the most important thing in my role is actually stakeholder management as a CEO. I think added on the board 
uh, you know, I was working with the board over the last seven years. I was constantly working with the board, but now um, as the CEO, it's different. So learning how to work closely with them and get great value out of their contributions. There's a lot of smart people there. Um, and then the other stakeholder are investors, actually. That was a new muscle for me to learn that. Um, you know, and then, you know, first and foremost is ruthless prioritization because there's not enough time in the day. And and so I wouldn't say that's a lesson learned, but it is whenever you take on a new job, you go through this this stage of uh, all the incremental work piling onto your plate and then how do you push things off, right? So getting back to that balance, it's taken about a year, but I feel like I'm in a good place now where with the amazing leadership team that I work with, I've been able to, okay, now you do these things and you do these things and kind of get to that balance of, I can't do everything I used to do. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there's definitely a transition time when you're you're both, I think, learning, and in your case, for uh, learning stakeholder management of uh, investors was a, was one of the things you were learning. Um, and uh, and your team has to learn, you know, how to how to take things off of you as well, right? Um, so that so that everybody can get the job done that's in front of them. Um, beyond why is Shen? Sorry, one side. Let me let me give you an example. So, like yesterday, I didn't show up to the team meeting, right? And in the past, they would cancel them. I said, no, no, if I'm not there for the team meeting, here, it's still the team needs to come together. And I had another commitment where I was with cut with ten customers, and I had to speak. So I'm like, keep the meeting together and. I asked them afterwards how how would that how to go, and then I got the feedback on actually we worked through these five different issues. So, you know, I I think those types of learnings where no, I don't have to be there all the time, work. empowerment for both of you, right? Uh, for them to develop and for you to um, pay attention uh, to other things that pop up. Um, so beyond that, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges um, of leadership? I'm I'm a little. I'm curious about your leadership style. I've certainly gotten a flavor as you talk for the last 20 minutes or so. Uh, but uh, what would you say are some of the biggest challenges that you see in leadership? Um, I would say that in leadership, I I don't know if I I would focus on challenges as much as the areas that I think we need to focus on is mm-hmm. is actually first and foremost people. You know, I I. Leadership is all about people. How do you how do you attract the right people? How do you develop them and performance manage those who aren't actually meeting the bar? And so, when I think if you actually focus on people, that has such a profound impact because good people do great things, right? That you can really focus on their success. And one of the first lessons I learned uh, when I first came out of university was uh, invest in the success of others, and you'll be successful. Don't think about yourself. If you think about the team that is around you and do everything you can to make everybody around you successful, you'll be successful. So that people part of it, I think, is by far the thing that I, you know, when everyone asks, well, what's most on your mind? What are you worried about? Whatever it is, people, 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 people nonstop. I love that you got that right out of university because it it takes um, often a long time for that to happen. It's, um, I think about it as we do what's what's in what we perceive as our best self-interest, Right. That's how we make decisions and take actions. And um, it's in our best self-interest for the people around us to do really well when we're working in an organization. Uh, it just takes a while to see that. So uh, terrific that you got that lesson so early in life. Yeah, and, it, and it, it's worked out well for me because it does, to your point, if you're not thinking about yourself, that brings, I think, the second part is that you can, you can actually realize that there's lots of times you're going to be wrong because you're focused on them and what they're trying to do. And if you're just thinking about yourself, then chances are you'd be wrong. And so the, you know, the second thing was great advice that I got, which is um, accept that you're going to be wrong and really embrace it. And the quote, there was this great leader who I worked with and she said, don't let me be wrong. And what she meant there was she told everybody around her, look, if you think I'm wrong and we're moving at a fast pace, you know, the only time I'll be mad at you is if you don't tell me that I'm wrong. Mm. If you don't tell me I'm wrong, you see me driving off a cliff, I'm going to be really irritated that you didn't take the time. And didn't care enough about me to stop me, right? But but if I am wrong, and so if you take the time and tell me that she says three things will happen, one of three. Well, first, I'm going to thank you for you know stopping me and having a conversation. Second, if I'm wrong, I will actually change my behaviors, learn and and adapt. Um, but the third thing is, and especially this is really important, the higher up you get. Third thing is, is that if the individual who thinks you're wrong actually doesn't understand the broader context. And so you take the time and explain the broader context, then that becomes a real opportunity to also understand how the organization thinking. 
because chances are if that person thinks you're wrong and doing the wrong thing, but then understands the broader context and realize, oh, that's why we're doing what we're doing, then it also becomes an opportunity as a leader to then communicate broadly across the company because chances are there's other people who think the same way and don't have that information or that context. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Um, I want to uh, bring us to a close, Michael, with um, with a question for you about your career. So the tagline for my consulting business is up and to the right, because that's the spot on the two by two matrix where we always want to be. Uh, was there a moment in your career when you were new, you, when you knew you were moving up and to the right? I would say that was when I decided to move from an individual contributor to a leader. Mm -hmm. And there was the first, and there were two elements to that. The first was that um, I started to really, my team was getting larger and larger, the virtual team that I managed. And, and I was really enjoying actually working with teammates and other groups, understanding their goals and, and coaching them to be successful. So I started to realize that achieving my own goals as an individual contributor was becoming less and less fulfilling and actually working with others and helping and seeing them win and thrive and succeed and then celebrating their success really became how I got fulfillment. So that was a shift that was happening. And then the second one was um, my wife and I were sitting together you know, in our backyard and she looked at me and she said, um, is this it on a Saturday morning? I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, she goes, is this it? Are we going to do this for the rest of our lives and die? I said, well, this is pretty great. We've got two little children, you know, got a great house, all that kind of stuff. This is pretty great. Clearly you're thinking about something. And she said, well, I think we should sell it all. We should move internationally and and I'm going to experience the word, world. Mm -hmm. So I attribute that, that, you know, as I was she's shifting as an individual around where I got satisfaction, but then at the same time, um, excitement for my partner, who was saying, you know, let's actually take a big risk and, and really change our lives up. Um, that was a big impetus for me. And I bluntly, I grew up in Alberta, which is like the Texans in Canada. I had, you know, was not a world traveler. She'd been around the world. So that doing this by myself never would have happened. And so her kind of prodding three years later, we were living in London in the UK with Microsoft. So um, without her, that never would have happened. And it was uh, those two things came together. And, and that was kind of the start of this next stage of my career. What a great story. Thank you for sharing that. Um, so our, our time is up. I just want to say thanks again, Michael, for joining us. Um, I know I learned a lot. Um, I'm sure um, the people who are listening did as well. And uh, wish you and your team all the best. Thanks for your time, Karen. It was great speaking with you. Okay.